in person. We're really proud that we have students, community partners, and faculty members and administrators and colleagues from across the city here today to, to join us in this session. It means so much that you're here. Um, and we want this to be as interactive as possible, obviously as experiential as possible. So please make sure to you know, ask questions and jump in, jump in the chat as well. Um, just a reminder, those folks that included an address in their registration should be receiving a little bit of a treat in the mail probably today. Um, so, you know, you might check your mailbox. There's some chocolate in there, so it's hot and it might melt. So just might want to keep an eye on that if, if you registered for that. Um, we, we do start um, in the Service Learning Academy with an, an, a land acknowledgement. This land acknowledgement was um, developed in partnership with Campus Compact, which is a national organization that supports um, community engagement and service learning efforts, as well as through um, consultation with the Native American Studies Department here at UNO. And so if you wouldn't mind, I'm just going to read and acknowledge the native lands in which we are coming. Um, a team member will also include in the chat uh, a resource for you to look and see if you're not coming from the Omaha metro area, where you might be joining us and on the native lands that you might be um, joining us. And you can please include that in the chat and or if you have any additional um, resources and or, you know, or your own land acknowledgement, please include that as well. Um, we deliver a land acknowledgement to acknowledge the historical legacy of colonialism by honoring and paying respect to the land, which was taken by conquest along with the domination of the people who inhabited the land and the imposition of white supremacy. We do it to raise greater public consciousness of native sovereignty and cultural rights as a small step toward equitable relationship and reconciliation. As such, we first recognize that we are guests living on lands represented by native nations whose sovereignty, governance, and treaty lands existed long before the state of Nebraska. These nations include the Omaha, Ponca, Santee, Ho-Chunk or Winnebago, Lakota, Pawnee, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Meskwaki, Odo, Missouri, Iowa, Kaw, Wichita, Kickapoo, and Delaware Nations. Again, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to um, Madeline Hagar, our Whites Fellow, who um, will continue along this, the session and she'll let me know if I've forgotten anything too, probably. Thank you so much, Julie. I think you got it all covered. Um, so before we begin our session today, we have to introduce our esteemed speaker, Barbara Holland and Chancellor Gold kindly offered to do so and pre-recorded a very warm welcome for us today. So we'll start our session with that. So just give me one moment to get that set up. If you can't hear this, just wave or unmute yourself and say something to let me know. Hello, I'm Dr. Jeff Gold, and I have the great honor of serving as the chancellor here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you, albeit virtually, for this year's Service Learning Showcase, and for affording me the honor of introducing your keynote speaker, Dr. Barbara Holland. I want to speak to you for a moment about what I expect will be a recurring theme in this showcase, and that is thinking globally and acting locally. You'll see this reflected in our university's mission, which is to transform and improve the quality of life for those we share a community with. In my view, service learning is the think global, act local mindset materialized in a very real way. Not only that, but service learning is the heartbeat of this leading metropolitan public university. This was no easy feat in 2020. The students, faculty, staff, and community partners and their families had to be strong. They had to be maverick strong. 
to carry out service learning projects that we'll discuss. I want each of you to know that our university and our community are so much better for these efforts. University leaders also see the profound personal impact that service learning has on students, even in challenging times like these days. When students know that they can apply the skills that they attain in the classroom in a real-world setting, they can truly understand the value of what a degree from UNO means. The depth and the meaning service learning adds to the university experience is a reason why it will continue to be one of the true pillars of UNO's completion imperative. And now, I would like to talk about someone who personifies much of what I have shared with you today. And that, of course, is Dr. Barbara Holland. About two years ago, maybe a little more, Dr. Holland and I sat down for a recording of a Maverick Minute interview series where she said something that I still believe to be absolutely true about UNO, and I quote, we are not just in the city, we are of the city, end quote. I can say the same of Dr. Holland. Not only is she an esteemed professor, researcher, and consultant, but she's a tireless advocate for this institution and very much a part of our core DNA. Her scholarship and her expertise in organizational change in higher education, with a special focus on the strategic impacts of community engagement as a method of teaching, learning, and research, have earned her international acclaim. Her current academic affiliations are as distinguished community engagement professor of the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and of course, a senior scholar at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, and the University of Carolina, Greensboro. She has served in senior academic administrative roles at several universities in the United States and Australia, and she's held a visiting scholar role in the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development headquarters now for two years with both the Clinton and Bush administrations. In addition, she was the executive director of the federally funded National Service Learning Clearinghouse for seven years. The library collection, upon the closing of the clearinghouse, was moved to the Chris Library at the University of Nebraska at Omaha in 2011 and is called the, and I quote, Barbara A. Holland Collection for Service Learning and Community Engagement, unquote. There is plenty more to say about Dr. Holland and the tremendous impact that she's had on this university community. But I don't want to take up all three days of this wonderful service learning showcase to do so. <laughs> Therefore, without further ado, it is my privilege and my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Barbara Holland. I can see all of the Zoom clapping and <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't say it any better than that. Um, <laughs> well, I appreciate him doing it. So yeah, that's just a great way to kick off our showcase week and this event in particular. So before we begin, I just kind of wanna say a few other things. Um, so first, today is really meant to be kind of a conversation between all of us. So while Barbara and I we'll be kind of talking and I have some questions that I'm really itching to ask her. There will be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions as well. And so if those come up during the conversation, please just put those in the chat and then we'll you know, get to them later on in the session. And then the second thing would be that for your viewing experience, if you wanna be able to see Barbara and myself side by side, I recommend using the pin feature on Zoom. So to use that, you hover over the participant's video that you want to pin. You click on the three dots in the upper right-hand corner and then select pin. And you can repeat that process to pin as many people's videos as you'd like. So again, that'll allow you to see the two of us kind of side by side speaking 
And that would be kind of in place of that active speaker view. So not a requirement, but if that's of interest, you're welcome to do so. We also have the live transcript feature on today. If you do not want to see those, you should be able to hit transcript and then click hide that view. Um, so those are just a few kind of technical Zoom notes about today. Um, and then otherwise, I would just ask that everyone mute themselves so that we can avoid any possible feedback during the session. So with all that said, without further ado, um, let's welcome Dr. Barbara Holland. Right. Okay. So many friends. <laughs> So my first question for you today, Barbara, is if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and specifically how you got started in the community engagement space. Um, well, um, I have, um, it, I would have to use the word serendipity. Um, it was sort of a, a conflation of um, a variety of things, uh, including um, moving around the country from one place to another that put me in a, in a place to meet some people that was um, an interesting opportunity. Um, and part of it was um, by accident, I think, um, I'm, I'm trying to reflect. Um, I mean, I, I, my bachelor's and, and master's were uh, School of Journalism at University of Missouri. Uh, Columbia is not a big city. <laughs> um, I was happy to escape it. Um, and I ended up just sort of felicitously um, living in cities. Um, and, and so I ended up sort of always being in a metropolitan area. I, I, I didn't really look at rural jobs. This whole thing is very ironic because I am in my head and my heart, a country girl. I have a very gigantic garden just right out my front window. <laughs> and uh, if I could have animals, I would. But I, I, I've always been in urban areas. Um, my little country mind has enjoyed uh, sort of scanning the state of, of, of cities and, and um, the cultures. I lived in Denver um, and that was uh, really exciting. I was in Pueblo in Southern Co uh, Colorado, uh, which was uh, an extraordinarily um, um, different environment and probably the most diverse uh, population uh, of any city in Colorado. And um, I learned uh, every place I went, I learned stuff. I moved around a lot. Um, so we could spend the whole time covering all my places. But from each place, I took a sense of, of the respect for the local culture and, and an, a recognition in doing this work of engagement between what is the role of an academic institution in a city? And a lot of the cities I was in, the institutions I was working for were really the big thing in town. Um, there may have been other big businesses or things, but uh, that was sort, sort of the education central. And it was, it's just been fascinating to me. I, I did move around a lot, not because I couldn't keep a job, but because I kept getting interested in new ideas about how higher ed affects their communities. And I don't know, I, part of it may have been, I was just, every time I moved to a new town, I wanted to know what it was about. What's the history? What, what's the population? What are the challenges? What are the, the things people treasure? And um, I don't know, I think that sort of set me down the road of, of falling into the engagement thing because I was interested in, in each one. Originally, my jobs were media relations. I, I was uh, media relations for my, my first three institutions. And it was interesting how that slowly morphed into me wanting to get a more academic position so that I could fix 
the crazy, stupid things that universities do to their communities. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. Um, so obviously at some point you find your way to UNO. And so Barbara, could you tell us a little bit about kind of service learning and how it's functioning at UNO and how that fits into that larger community engagement effort? Well, uh, certainly um, over time, uh, I, I have to say um, without really without bias that um, UNO is at this point really an exemplar and probably one of the most admired institutions in the country for the infrastructure and commitment, the visible physical commitment that this institution has made to a, an ambitious agenda. And it's, it's supported, uh, certainly it's hosted um, regional and, and national uh, conventions and, and meetings. Uh, and everybody who comes from other places leaves thinking UNO is a special place they have made the most extraordinary commitments to the resources and 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 concrete <laughs> concrete buildings that are dedicated to this work and uh, there's really nothing like it in the country could you speak a little bit more to kind of so outside of that infrastructure kind of yeah dig in a little bit more into what makes what makes UNO unique and special in this specific area? Um, uh, well, the people, certainly people and personalities. Um, and I think you've been very fortunate in um, a series of leaders of the campus who uh, each had their own vision and interpretation of engagement. Um, but I think felicitously, um, encouraged it and appreciated it. Um, I certainly have spent enough time there that um, there have been uh, points of time where I felt like I, um, I should just call up the mayor and say, Hi, howdy, um, how's it going? Um, but it, it's, um, I appreciate um, the way that um, UNO thinks about engagement and the the reason that the building and the and the support that is within the building, the importance of that is not just symbolic, it's practical. I remember when we were looking at the blueprints and thinking about the spaces and how we wanted to do it and what it would all allow us to do. Um, it truly has transformed um, to a great degree the normalization of engagement as something that is very important to the institution and that everybody doesn't have to participate in it, but everybody understands it's an important part of the blood of the university. And um, and I, I have also appreciated the time to go out into communities and meet and with a lot of the uh, organizations and schools and people that you work with. I remember many, many interesting trips around that. And um, I, and I think what, what, what really sets apart is the, there are certainly issues. We still have issues with the deans. We still have issues with uh, faculty who think this is not an important part of their work. But I would say over time, again, the, the presence uh, that you, you held so many conferences, regional and national, that the, when people came to visit that campus, they saw a level of commitment that they couldn't even dream of. And so I think in some ways, the, the shape and the, the practical um, support for engagement at UNO has been a national influence in many ways. Um, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm just thinking, you know, we have all this infrastructure, there is that spirit and dedication and commitment at UNO. And kind of despite, I don't know if despite's the right word, but just so much has changed over this past year. And even at a place 
that has all of that infrastructure, that has those teams and those people. You know, COVID, COVID still happened. It still arrived at our doors and changed the way that our work kind of happened day to day. And so I'm curious kind of on a high level, how you think the pandemic has forced kind of community engagement spaces, service learning departments like ours to kind of work or rethink the way that we're doing our work? Well, I this is something I have very strong opinions about. I I am uh, I would say starting back in March when my cardiologist called me and said you have to sequester in your house and learn how to get grocery delivery, and that's been my life ever since. <laughs> and um, I I have to say I, I've been very disturbed and disappointed by the reaction of most institutions. And I actually, yesterday, um, a colleague, a very close colleague of mine, of my generation, of, um, Bill Tierney, who's um, still uh, running a center at University of Southern California, wrote a um, Really, it was it was just yesterday, um, and I commend it to you. And I, if I may, I want to read two paragraphs of what he wrote, which is how I will answer your question, because Bill and I have have a lot of um, shared beliefs about how engagement has been important to the appreciation of certainly for. Let's just stick with public institutions for the moment, since you are one. Um, um, Bill and I and others of our generation um, are concerned because in historically when the, the United States had crises, higher ed was at the table, working hard, sleeves rolled up and figuring out how do we help. It goes back to, he's, he, I commend you to read his, his piece if you haven't already. He goes back, as I often do, to World War II and the, the cooperation of universities to just flip their entire campuses to giving a basic education to many, many, many people who would never have gotten any education further than maybe even partial school. Um, and to, as a way to really ramp everything up, but also the growth in the commitment of research to flip to the importance of what the conditions were at the time. And as that went on, after the war was over, we of course created the community colleges. We, the, I, I think um, higher ed was very uh, good at convincing the entire government, state governments and, and the national government that a large and healthy uh, educational network is going to be good for the economy and for the community. And it really, higher ed was critical in the 60s, 70s and 80s. It was certainly, most campuses were the platform for the early pushes for uh, equality. And um, higher ed played an incredible role in, the, in raising that again and again and again. And I'm happy to say I feel this time after in my life, 70 years old, I feel like this time we're going to get it right. It feels like it's, I, I see the changes in voice and in the way we approach it. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, we kept trying and it would always start strong and then kind of fade away. And now it feels like it's really gonna stick. And part of what I really see now that I'm very excited by is the growth and the expansion of, of leadership being diverse across higher ed. And in this, um, but my unhappiness that I'm gonna share with you Dr. Tierney and I come from that history of when we've had crises, when we needed to get a man on the moon, higher ed stepped up, when we wanted to work on racial equality, higher ed mostly stepped up, but not always. 
And it's, it's interesting how we are now in this last year off the radar. And there are some institutions like yours that have stayed very busy and figured out how can we keep in connection with our, with our partners, with our affiliates, um, how can we sustain our programs? How can we keep our students still having that opportunity to be learning about community and to be learning about diversity? And you've, you've kept that up as best as you can in this time. And, um, but a lot of others have just said, holy cow, we've got too much to do. I, service learning is off the chart. We can't do it. Oh my God, we can't, there's no way. It's unsafe. It's, it's, it's impossibly complicated. Um, and you didn't do that. So, so Bill uh, wrote a fabulous essay. I do commend it to you to read the whole thing, but I wanna read you um, these two paragraphs. Um, Today, higher ed is largely a bystander to the challenges that confront our society. Most institutions are simply struggling to keep their institutions afloat and nothing else. If the public were asked how important our institutions are in fighting COVID, many people would not even understand the question. Higher ed is viewed as a spectator more than a participant. Not so at UNO, my friends. Not so. Thank you for that, Barbara. Yeah, I definitely, I think we've got that piece linked now into the chat. And there's so much that you just said there that I really want to spend some time unpacking, kind of including, you know, you were commending, you know, for staying open. And I think too, just what's happening on our campus is that that push for equity and equality, especially when it comes to racial equity, is we're hearing that again, right? We have new DEI efforts. We have the big ideas coming out at UNO. And so I'm curious to hear from you when we think about pushing for racial equity within higher ed institutions and in the civic engagement space, things that we should keep in mind as we're doing that work, thinking about both the projects that we might be doing through the service learning courses, but also thinking about community engaged scholarship and how to kind of maintain and facilitate those relationships and partnerships. Well, that's a that's a big recipe. <laughs> uh, so you can you can catch me on all the different parts of that as we as we play along. So. Uh, I'll start with um, my reality is um, um, I'm in my house, I have my cat. Um, and so this um, Zoom is my world. And um, a lot of people complain about it, but my footnote on that is uh, it is my salvation. So thank you um, for doing this. It's a lot of fun. Um, but uh, my, my, my contemporary ability to know what's happening around the country like I used to do has faded away because um, of, of the fact that ev almost every university has dispersed their employees into their homes. Uh, that's changing a little bit now and probably will continue to grow over time. But over the last year, um, it, it's been hard to really track um, how different institutions have uh, adapted their agenda for engagement and service learning, uh, which um, it's, I, it's, it has been uh, checkered, uh, that's for sure. I would say the vast majority of universities have ditched it. Um, I, I, that's my word, they probably would say suspended. Um, <laughs> but um, it, I think for many universities it fell into the too hard pile and especially around um, when they were thinking of how do we just get students off uh, that are off campus uh, getting their coursework done. Um, and, I, and I get that to some degree. And I think there's some, I think as a footnote um, in a way, um, thinking about our conversation today uh, and the, the UNO strategies and my experience of you over time, um, 
I, I, it doesn't surprise me you didn't walk away because this is, this is in the blood of the institution. And that's not true at a lot of institutions. So for many, it was pretty easy to say, this is gonna be in the too hard pile to keep students doing things. But some um, did really creative things and uh, you may have done some of these things too. I sure don't know all of your strategies in detail, but a number of institutions, certainly University of Pittsburgh doubled down on helping school students um, especially because their urban area is um, not a wealthy urban uh, area and um, most of the wealthy people live out in the suburbs. And um, so the university um, is from the very beginning last March and, and even through uh, more today, um, doing a lot of things around making sure that um, equity and access to the internet and um, really fighting for that. I, I mean, it was really some bold stuff. It wasn't like just being helpful, um, but they did organize um, uh, staff, not, not faculty. Faculty had to do their faculty jobs, but staff and students um, uh, as tutors and um, um, other kinds of services to, they really doubled down on supporting the urban schools and urban children. And I thought that was really an interesting and, and very, very helpful focus because uh, all of us have seen in the news how um, schools are really struggling to support their students, especially students who have uh, different ways of learning. And um, I, so the, that story is one that I, I really enjoy telling. Um, and I think it's been, it, it has been very checkered, but I, I, I was really impressed by Bill's essay yesterday because truthfully, most institutions have walked away from engagement. Um, the only other one I can give you any, any anecdotes about is my local institution, uh, Portland State, which took, um, I think in a way uh, as, as Pittsburgh did uh, to develop a sharp focus and their sharp focus was homelessness because we are one of the mo most um, affected by homelessness uh, in the country and we are probably one of the worst at managing it. And um, that has become a very large and very ambitious um, uh, strategy to try to really create change. Um, it's been an issue for probably 20 years in this area um, because we have a relatively mild climate, people are drawn here. And we do provide a lot of non-for-profit services um, that are very supportive to people, but it doesn't help them get out of homelessness. So in this time of COVID, they're doubling down on its time to figure out how do we help people get into homes? And I could bore you for a long time with what they're doing with a lot of experiments of different kinds of facilities and different kinds of programs. And um, that is, um, so right now, higher ed is, is waffling around engagement. And, and it's not surprising, but when, again, I think about um, Bill's entire essay um, shame on a lot of universities, especially in the big cities um, that are just saying it's in the too hard pile because they are huge resources. I think it's less uh, in the smaller towns and the more rural towns with universities, there's no way they can walk away. And um, places like Ball State are um, doing a great job supporting the public schools. Um, they have been able to um, find ways to support equity again of access for students and, and uh, grade schools and high schools to have access to the internet and know how to do it, how to use it and that sort of thing. And, um, but the urban institutions have mostly shut down their engagement agendas and called it in the too hard pile. And I think that's unfortunate. But now they're gonna, I, I, as we, of course, the whole vaccination thing, it's gonna be interesting to see how partners react when, when those universities show up and say, hi, haven't seen you for a year, how's it going? Um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, that's kind of a great transition into my next question. So kind of so far, you've been talking about that value of universities kind of coming through having that focused agenda and connecting with community and working alongside them. And so I'm curious, you know, yeah, thinking about we've stepped away and even in Zoom, you know, we're still there is still that element of distance. You're not able to meet with people face to face. Things can get lost in the digital translation. And so I'm curious to hear a little bit about how you think that we could continue to strengthen those partnerships with community as we think about doing some of this work to push forward those agendas towards equity. You know, thinking about, I know we have a lot of professors here today, how, how they can structure their research or their courses around working with community to folks like myself in the Service Learning Academy and thinking about how we, we can kind of work with partners in the future as well. Wow, that's a lot of ideas. <laughs> so, um, um, what I'm what I'm hearing around the country is um, um, that in this time, there are not many universities who have an agenda. Um, you have an agenda. Portland State has an agenda. Um, I, a number of other universities around the country have taken a sharp focus because they just can't do everything. And um, and but I again most have just decided that if faculty working off campus want to continue to do their engagement work, then they can continue to do it. Um, and. I don't have a sense that there's a lot of, uh, of, of, of attention to that by uh, institutional leadership. And uh, I don't think uh, service learning is being damaged by this. I think it's just being temporarily ignored by a lot of institutions. And, and, and it's stunning how many institutions, when they just completely closed, vacated, sent everybody home. Um, and of course, I, to be forgiving, it, it happened very rapidly back last spring, um, but it was really August or September before many of them even put their head up above water and said, what do we need to do to support our faculty? And, and I think a lot of the attention went to faculty, which is not inappropriate, um, because they wanted to make sure that they could be set up because that they were going to be all be doing virtual teaching. And again, I think that just kind of pushed engagement off to the side in most places. It's, it's I, but again, I, I don't, I don't have a sense that that means it's not coming back. I think they just put it in the too hard pile and Trust me, I'm not saying that in a way that I am forgiving them. I'm sort of explaining them, perhaps is the way to put it, because um, if some can do it and figure it out, why can't they all? Yeah, so that kind of brings up a follow up for me of, you know, folks who even even once maybe we return to a post pandemic world, folks who will still want to stay kind of removed from community um, for fear of, you know, kind of having that ivory tower kind of looking down on community or it affecting kind of their position within the university or their scholarship to do this community engaged work. So what would you say to folks who might have that fear? Even, even once logistically, it might be a little bit more E it might be a little easier. Um, tell me more. Yes. So we received a question um, earlier that was saying, sometimes in academia, professors and scholars want to remain removed from the community for fear that their research is seen as activist scholarship with a built-in bias. Ah. So how would you help them kind of navigate those moral, political, and academic decisions around participating in community-engaged work? 
Well, I, I, I don't have any direct expertise in that, but, um, but my advice as a person who might be the service learning person in a university with um, that, um, that, that idea of floating around um, I think it, the institutions that are doing well and staying connected to their community are offering faculty support and, and assistance and not leaving them to figure it out on their own. And I think certainly UNO has been very effective with that in terms of supporting your faculty who want to continue to um, keep their partnerships alive at some level um, as appropriate to being safe. And, um, but again, I, I, I have to say, I'm stunned and amazed at how many institutions have just said um, that's off the table and we'll do that later. Um, and I, I don't know how it's, it's gonna be interesting. I'll say it this way. It, it'll be interesting to see how that works out after everything opens up again and we have a more uh, open experience again out in the community, which will certainly happen at some point. But I, I feel like um, in a way I'm forgiving and okay with, with faculty who want to continue their work and those that don't. I think it's a really personal decision because um, health, this is a life and death crisis around the country. and. I think it's everybody's individual choice on how far they can go um, in terms of keeping up their work and their context. Um, and I, I'm, I don't have any sense, but, but I may be naive because I'm, I'm not as connected as I used to be, um, that, that there's anybody taking any advantage of this situation. Um, I think more, more of what I've heard, again, is institutions that have just completely ignored it and those that are trying to sustain fragments of their agenda so that it is still going to be with them when things get more normal. I think that's really been the pattern. And of course, their individual faculty make their own decisions within that, um, the institutional's, institution's guidance they make their own decisions about how deeply they accept that. Um, I, I will say um, I, some institutions like Portland State have um, tried to organize very intentionally uh, a very substantial and robust group of faculty who had similar interests um, in their engagement agenda. And uh, they are now um, very happily supported by the administration has offered some, some resources to um, work on this uh, homeless agenda, which is breaking the back of the city uh, and causing incredible problems, um, not just for the homeless, but also safety. And uh, some of you may have heard we've been invaded by Antifa and other people who have um, tried to uh, turn uh, friendly, um, casual, <laughs> hippy-dippy Portland into a war zone. And uh, it's, been, it's been really hard here on that because they are still um, downtown every night destroying things just because they can. And that's made it even harder to support the homeless people. But I, I have to say the, the coalition that has formed between the government of the city and Portland State's working group on homelessness um, is stronger than ever at this time. And that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I have to agree. That's really exciting to see that continued dedication and renewed energy to despite everything that's going on to keep working towards um, fighting homelessness. So we've been talking to a lot about different sorts of transitions. And so in addition to potentially transitioning back into more in-person service learning, we also will be welcoming a new chancellor to UNO in several months. And so I'm curious to see if you have any thoughts around 
how we could potentially strategically onboard that person and introduce them into this world of community engagement and service learning. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, first of all, uh, you need to find out everything you can about 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 her. And um, I know that there uh, is a, a infrastructure for engagement at that institution. Uh, you've probably already figured that out. Um, and you might chat with those folks. Um, always a good idea to get their, their ideas and their perspectives on her interest in this as a topic in her mind. Um, and, um, and then I think when she arrived, I, I, you can, um, uh, we can, we can talk. I'll be happy to help. After all, I, I have some connection <laughs> with you. Um, I, I think it'd be uh, fun to send her some information and, um, and some examples and uh, kind of give her a flavor of, of what's happening now. So she, um, already has that in her reading. I'm guessing if she's like a lot of women presidents making a move, she's going to be very thoughtful about reading and reflecting on anything and everything she can get her hands on uh, to feel um, familiar and to, and to um, come onto campus with an appreciative uh, insight of, of what has been going on and how she wants to find her way into that, um, that particular culture. And, um, and I think it's very uh, important early on to think about um, a tour. It's an old fashioned idea, but, um, but it, it's, um, it's never, never uh, a bad thing to see things on the ground and take a walk through a school building as um, everything comes back um, into the way we're going to be operating schools in the future. I'm sure it'll be a little different, but, but there will be the opportunity to visit and introduce her to some of our very pertinent and very important, um, sorry, that's the cat with a ping pong ball. <laughs> um, uh, I think you want, we want to introduce her to um, important people in, in the community and, and vice versa. Um, and so it may be, you may want to um, in the first, have kind of have phases of it. You might in your first phases sort of think of some critical people in the community that you would like to introduce to her first. And, um, and let them speak to her. And so she's hearing about the engagement and service learning agenda from the community and not just you. Um, and uh, I think that that would be, I'm, I'm guessing you'll learn a lot about her personality um, by doing that. And I, I, I have a good feeling about this person. I, I'm, I've, I have um, been in contact with the, uh, service learning person at that university for probably the last five years. So um, I have a good feeling about it. Great. Thank you for sharing those insights. I have one final question for you, Barbara, before. Oh, yeah, just one? <laughs> just one. I know. <laughs> we could be here all day, but just one before I want to give all of the lovely folks who are on this call a chance to ask you questions as well. So my final one is kind of in reflection about who we are, we like to think about aspects of ourselves that we'd like to add and also things that we'd like to let go of. And so as a field of service learning and community engagement, what do you think that those aspects would be? In terms of what the field needs to let go of? Yes. Uh, uh, we definitely need to continue. We'd already started it before COVID hit. Um, uh, Every institution in the country that wants to be engaged needs to be constantly monitoring a level of focus because random doesn't lead to much. It can lead to a few things that are nice and but maybe not lasting. And I, you, you, it, UNO is such an exemplar for 
doing this. Um, and I, I hope you will continue and have ways to share it, that it's how well it's worked for you to have a focused agenda that is the institutional commitment and it can have different levels and different angles, but it's, it's a, a, a consolidated commitment where we are really looking for progress, measurable change. And, and that does not in any way and should not in any way eliminate random faculty who have a very discreet interest but we want to keep them in the fold. And so it's part of the trick in this kind of thing is when you have um, a focused agenda that may have several threads, um, you don't want to lose sight of your independent faculty who have discrete interests. And we want to make sure that those are going well as, as, as well and, and that we're supporting those people and their partners. And you have, of course, uh, many ways to do that and you've done it over many years. So I'm telling you what you already know. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. I'm now gonna turn it over to Julie, who will be kind of facilitating our Q&A. So again, if you have any questions, we can put them in the chat, uh, don't be shy. So yeah, all right, all right Julie. Can you, would you mind just giving us a heart, a, uh, you know, a wave, a congr uh, you know, a clap for Dr. Holland for sharing today and her, <laughs> it's so great. Thank you all that we're feeling the love today. Um, Laura says applause in the chat. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holland for, for sharing your time today. And also a quick um, shout out and congrats and heart emoji to Madeline, who is an excellent facilitator of that uh, moderator of that of that session. So thank you both for that. Um, so we have some questions, um, Dr. Holland, a little bit about one of them is about um, support for community engaged scholarship and how on a campus we can be, you know, we, we know that there's some of our we've done, you know, are teaching really well. How can we get engaged scholarship funding? How can we get support for that um, better um, and, and move that initiative forward? Do you have suggestions for us as a campus? Well, it would have to be funding for what? Um, so um, I, I think um, especially, I'm, I'm, I, am, I am very hopeful about the new president because I'm, I'm She's coming from an institution that has been pretty engaged. How the quality of it, this, sorry. <laughs> Life happens. Okay. Those of us who live in the country still have a real phone, just in case. Um, uh, I, I, th I think it's, I, um, I think she's going to be, I'm, I, I'm very hopeful about her effect. I think what you have to identify is what the needs are. Um, it's, it, it's, can you be a little more specific? Because um, you're not gonna be able to get resources or a strategy around support if we don't know what the support is. That's a, I mean, that's a good question. I, I don't know if I have, you know, the whole, it was kind of engaged scholarship more, um, Really, you know, in general, but I think your 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 answer is a good one. The first the first step is figuring out what you know what the yeah, what, what need? list of what those things are. What um, do they so need? We, yeah, and it may be and it may be individualistic, but um, I'm betting there's a pattern, and um, and and part of it is um, I, I want to be. I, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit of a tutor here. Um, some faculty will feel that they need some support because they feel like they're doing something really important, but they're worried that it's not necessarily seen by their colleagues as, as, as traditional scholarship. Um, and so there may be some more emotional support as much as um, 
staff support, our money support, our time support. Um, it's all of those are issues for faculty and they all develop sort of react to it in their own personality. Um, and so it's kind of, it's kind of hard to have a pattern um, unless you, you might want to think about a survey of a lot of your relatively active faculty and you get some anonymous in, in, info, I might try that. And um, if you maybe interview a few people and get some ideas about the kinds of things that they have on their mind that you think this is an issue. Um, I have to say, I think it's very thoughtful that you're doing this because uh, not many institutions have bothered to ask faculty, what kind of support do you need? Uh, some do, some don't. Um, but um, yeah, I think maybe a survey would be a good way to um, get some information and then we can talk about what we do with that. Um, but I, it would be also interesting to, as you do this, uh, to keep track of it because again, you are a leading institution in engagement. If you, if you find out something really interesting in a pattern about what support for faculty doing a certain kinds of maybe research-based um, engagement, what kind of supports they ask for, um, that's a publication, it might be a book. So it's, it's um, any, any kind of question like that, I, I, I think of it, it's a research problem. problem. Mm -hmm. you, need, you need data. One of the things that I think our faculty, faculty members and partners have done well is doing it collab, doing research and collaboratively in scholarship together. And I, I think um, that's that's um, important. I think it's, it's definitely a model that you've encouraged us to move forward as well. So yeah, and and, and truthfully, I mean, I I don't know what's happened over the last year. I'm I'm so uh, I'll ask you a question. <laughs> So are you sort of doubling down on trying to keep the, in, the relatively intense commitment you've made to working with schools? Absolutely. I mean, our, our work and the relationships that we've built over time, the priority around collaborating with the P16 initiative is so core to, you know, how we've how we think about service learning so much so that we talk about service learning, you know, in kind of like three different ways. There's different models and approaches that faculty members can use and community partners can connect to. And one of those is that P16 model. So um, that's definitely still a part of how we're thinking about this. It certainly does, again, like you mentioned, require a lot more hoops to jump through and, um, and a couple of in a couple of cases, folks have said it's you know in the in the too hard pile right now. But um, there's been so many workarounds that we've been able to continue through, um, and and students have shown up in ways that have been really exciting and faculty and partners as well. So um, yeah, I well, think that that continues. I want to I want to I want to say something that I've um, I thought about. I've been thinking about this call for the last three or four days and. Um, the, this, this focus on really reflecting on faculty and, and their needs um, in regard to engagement and service learning um, reminds me of something I really wanted, wanted to raise at some point in, in this event. And, and I, I will begin with a story as old people do. <laughs> so I have, I have witnessed in every decade of my life, the, the breakout of a hopeful agenda to create racial equality in this country. And each decade, it, it appears and there's intensity and then it just sort of slowly evaporates. And there's always some progress, but we haven't really gotten far. And I wanna say in this time when everyone 
is a little scared and everyone is spending a lot of time in their own head um, because of the conditions around us. And, and it's the whole country, it's the whole world. I think just in the last six months, even since really um, last September, I have seen institutional movements and in higher ed that tells me this may be the first time in my life that we're actually gonna make some serious headway on racial equality. And I'll tell you um, some of my signs on that are things like who's leading some of these conversations, um, the selection of presidents, vice presidents, other senior people, deans, chairs, big change in who is being selected for those at institutions. And the voice that those people have instantly. And I've been on a lot of Zooms and it's a very different Zoom in this time than in all of my life before now. And I feel very, very hopeful. I'm sure it's uneven across the country and I'm sure it's uneven across institutions, but I have seen and observed a lot of signs that we're really, there are institutions who are really making changes and changes that look to be lasting. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited by that. And I, think, and I think it ties to engagement in the community because that's where the people are. <laughs> And, and that's how I, it, I mean, I'm, I'm partly leaning here on Portland State, which is a very troubled city around race. And um, most of you would probably know that horrible long history going back to the about 1900 when the constitution said no person of color could be in the state for more than 48 hours or something. And they didn't take it out until about 10 years ago. I, it's, it's changing all over the country. And, and I, I see the signs, I'm, I'm on a lot of Zooms and I like what I'm seeing when the faces come up and, and the voices are heard. I, I just feel like we're making some headway that may last. Well, Doctor, thank you, thank you, Dr. Holland. I appreciate that. That's very inspirational, I'm getting message it we're all getting a little misty right here right yeah this is really important and certainly a priority of of the service learning academy with our asset-based community engagement models as our priority around redlining our anti-poverty service learning work to all of those things coming together are really important and those are just some of the ways that we feel like in our sphere that we can in you know connect to our assets and our partners and, and, I, and you space. have you have partners and you may have already done this but i think you may think about partners that are playing significant roles with you, especially as again, it engagement is going to change as you come back into going out into communities physically. I, I think you need to give some of the people that you're working with the community an attachment to the university that is, is it may be symbolic, but but they should be a member of if, if we're going to be partners, we should be um, sharing in the same same commitments. Right. Well, one of the ha hats and identities that you wear, Barbara, I know is a journalist. And um, so Dr. Katie White submitted a question about how do we kind of, have you seen any communities where journalists will report on community engagement or regular segments about uplifting the work of community organizations and students specifically in an effort to get kind of this community engagement message into the wider Nebraska um, community? Yeah, I, I, I yes, um, largely in cities um, and in rural areas, not so much um, for fairly obvious reasons. 
Um, but that doesn't mean we can't get around it. Um, I think I think the thing is to um, how do I want to say this? Um, I, I'm it, I'm I'm been I, I spend so much time alone in myself. I, I have lots of time to figure out what I want to say, and so um, I I feel that what the the focused agenda I think is going to be more important in engagement. And if we have a more focused engagement, then we have a better sense of who we want to connect to and who we want to know about what we're doing. Um, if we keep moving away from random, as you have at your institution, if we keep moving away from random engagement that is uh, temporary or short term, um, the more focused we are, then the more we can actually draw people in and help them understand why this is a benefit. And and that's not a bad thing for us to do because we don't always have, we haven't always done this in the field. We tend to be excited that we had an event and the event went well. And, um, and we may later check to see if it had any impact or lasting impact or caused any um, transformation of, of behavior or our lifestyle or um, are continuing uh, to be to be practiced. Um, I, this is this is all back to the the, the focused agenda um, and the battle mm -hmm. against random work and um, with still some respect for faculty who want to do random work. But we can't tell them they can't. But <laughs> it's not really engagement. Maybe we can think of a new word for it. Well, but but I, I think it's. Um, it's very important to make sure that everyone who's engaging in, in this, the community people, the students, the faculty, staff, um, need to feel supported. Um, and it's always tricky to figure out what support is really real, if awesome. that makes any sense. Yeah, thank you so much. That's great. And uh, an agenda together, it sounds like, is one of the things that we need to think about. So um, Dr. Matt Hale also has a question here about technology. Um, can you share your perspectives on the role of technology in service learning, such as partnering with community organizations to create technology and technological solutions to solve community identified um, opportunities? And what maybe insights would you share with a faculty member like him trying to connect computer science students with community organization that would benefit from those skill sets? Uh, I, I would um, definitely, uh, without passing go, um, contact Lena Distilio at University of Pittsburgh because um, that has been her approach in setting up the engagement agenda that the University of Pittsburgh has done to provide uh, technology and support for school children um, who didn't have it. And um, she's, it's the only one I know um, of, I'm sure there are others around the country where um, a very targeted issue um, uh, was solved by technology and the way she did it was, was quite clever and uh, had a huge impact. So, um, that would be a good place to start. And she may know others. Great. I think we have one more question, Dr. Hall. Did you want to ask your question or do you want me to? Sure, I can ask it. Great. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Um, I really appreciate you talking about monitoring a level of focus, having that focused agenda. And yep. um, that's I think that's something that we in the, the SLA thought about when we were thinking of um, continuing with redlining as an initiative, especially in thinking about your statement previously, to what end? Yep. And so thinking about that, um, what kind of advice would you give to faculty who are thinking about um, agenda setting and coming from the faculty staff to the administration? Like how do they get buy-in um, from the administration? How do they get traction? What, tell me, <coughs> sorry, um, tell me more about, um, give me an example of um, um, 
what kind of, of traction are they looking for? Sure. So we have faculty who are working on like really um, creative and innovative uh, sustainability projects um, or uh, folks like Dr. Hale um, working on um, technology projects that are um, connecting community partners with um, technological support. Um, but those could be connected to larger initiatives, um, larger issues that could really connect to our, our community engagement mission. Um, so I'm just thinking, how can those faculty members who have these, these projects th that are really focused, um, how could they get buy-in from the, the university leadership to sounds, create a, an agenda? It, it sounds like, um, is there a sense that leadership isn't interested? Uh, not necessarily. Are <laughs> <laughs> just utterly unaware. <laughs> and I have to say, I think, I know we have folks on here who um, represent community partners. Um, so I'm thinking about like, not even just at um, a university, but wherever you are, where you have, you know, as a staff person, you may have some ideas that could lead to larger initiatives that could be adopted by your your organization or your institution and that could connect to larger mission goals. I, 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 I have seen uh, cer certainly Portland State has an, an intense interest in having staff be involved in engagement. And, um, and I, I think that it, it, what it, it, you are correct. The trick is to get the, I, I wouldn't say the executives, but like I'm thinking more strategically that it's like the sub executives that need to be convinced that this is really a good thing that um, certain, certain staff should have time and opportunity to be engaged uh, as part of the agenda of the institution. And I would, I would sort of work up through the line going up, not down, um, because it's too easy at the top to say, oh, too hard and nothing I've ever heard of before. So I would start with sort of working up the layers. And, um, and I think it's very important to um, connect it to some aspect of they're um, the, peop the, the people who are promoting and, and, and wanting to do these things to be very clear about what the benefit is and what the outcome is intended to be and, um, and how it contributes and connects to their work. And so it's not, it's like I'm weaving it in. I, I'd, like, I'd like to have my, my boss let me weave this in to my work, not that I'm gonna set something of my work aside and I want time to do this. I wanna weave it in and have it something complimentary. And, um, and for some things it could be in partnership with um, people, staff at, at the center um, or um, certainly um, the people who are already working in the community. It may be a special thing they can do or you could have Accountants who want to um, help a nonprofit organization develop a better accounting system in their practice, and that would be allowed for them to do in, in their work time as something that is a, 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 a contrib contribution to the community. Does that make any sense, or am I not getting it? <laughs> that makes so much sense. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, I think I think you have to give. I, I don't start at the top. Start with with a per, friendly people who have um, are closer to real life, <laughs> and and have a, a practical example, and 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 what it would mean in terms of of impact. I think it's a great idea. I'm I'm not sure I've heard anybody really raise that before. Um, I, back when we had money in the service 
learning world, uh, when we had Learn and Serve America, um, there was much more of that kind of activity. And that's, that's that was an interesting thing I was doing and thinking about today um, when Madeline and I were thinking about what, what I'd talk about. Um, one of the, the things I, I can say is I'm fascinated how, how much progress we've made. And, and it feels to me almost like a flash, I'm sure to others it may not, but um, this whole idea only emerged in around 1992 when Bill Clinton was elected. And the, one of the first things he did was set up Learn and Serve America. And overnight, we all had money. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we need to think about going back to the feds and because I think this is what we're going to have to do to help people of all backgrounds and all conditions to get past this COVID crisis and back to work mm -hmm. and or in work for the first time in a long time. So I, I think it'd be really interesting to have I don't know that Joe Biden has any any idea about what the the corporation and national community service still exists, but only on a thread. And it would be interesting to reactivate it. You've got me thinking now. <laughs> well, and we have our policy faculty members on here saying, "Yay, that sounds like a good idea too." Oh, I I, th I think that I think this could have I think this could have legs. We could put a coalition of of universities around the country that. Um, that we've mentioned today and some others that are certainly Minnesota and um, some others that are outstanding and make a pitch. Well, that reminds me too of, you know, with Dr. to Dr. White's question, you know, back in Learn and Serve days, that's when that engagement was accessible to a lot of other campuses too and other institutions and communities. So. Thank you so much for those sentiments. I'm going to turn it back over to Madeline, who's going to remind us about the showcase. But again, um, one last um, thank you to you, Dr. Holland, for being here and for your insight and for your expertise. You've inspired us, you've moved us, um, and you've helped us to, you know, vision for what we can do next and acknowledged the amazing work that these community partners, faculty members and students and staff and team have done. So thank you for that today. Well, my, my, fi my final words are be audacious. I, I love that. And Julie, you took the words right out of my mouth. Thank you again, Dr. Holland. And thank you to all of our faculty, staff and partners who are able to join us today. Um, the links to register for our other events are in the chat. So tomorrow there will be a digital collection of student service learning work that will go live that you can access via our website. And then on Thursday, we'll have a session about our Maverick Philanthropy Initiative. So if you register to attend via those links, you'll receive an email with all the information that you need to access those materials. Um, I think a few of us might stick around for a couple more minutes, but I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their Tuesday. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, all. Bye. Thanks, you guys. Great job. Nice to see you. Thank you, Katie.